Thank you. Uh, so we're here today. Uh, here's some of the objectives. We're going to show how to use the content enrichment web service to light up the new search experience, see how we can use enrichment to create really compelling search uh, experiences. We'll go in detail uh, through the new content processing architecture in SharePoint 2013. And uh, last, we'll show some techniques for achieving scale and full tolerance when you build out the uh, web service, uh, the content web service extensions. Uh, before we go into it, I'm going to show you the search architecture uh, at scale again, at a high level overview. You've probably seen this before now a few times with other sessions. So it's going to quickly just repeat for those of you who haven't seen it yet or just for a little reminder. Uh, on the left hand side, we have content. So we can process content uh, through the crawler, both SharePoint content and any content that lives outside of SharePoint through connectors. Uh, we're going to show that in a demo today and, and utilizing some of the connectors there. Uh, the crawler will then pull it in and feed it to the content processing component, which is the one we're going to talk in depth about today. Today, It can call out all different content from both SharePoint and from, BC, uh, from BCS, external content, LOB system content, feed that that can go to the content enrichment web service. And that box on the top there is something I'm going to show you how you can set up uh, and we're going to use that for our uh, demos today. In the uh, fast search in the core, that's where all the documents uh, are fed from the content processing. After basically taking PDFs and Word documents, all converting it to text and handing it off to the search index. It creates the, the inverted index that's now available through the, uh, from the web front end for the query processing to query. So on the right hand side, you have the UX, which could be the SharePoint UX out of the box or custom created apps. I'm going to show some of that today too, how we can use apps to query all the content uh, as well. The um, analytics processing component uh, is there to analyze all usage behavior and also links that the content processing component will feed uh, to the, the, the component. And on the bottom here we have the search admin so you can control and access all of, this, uh, all of these components through PowerShell. Also, each of these boxes you see here are individual scalable, so you can scale out uh, depending on the amount of content you have or uh, uh, traffic or also number of documents or high query volume. So all of these boxes are accessible through PowerShell to just add on. Other sessions has gone into that uh, in, in detail. So just to clarify, we're going through the content processing component and we'll show what it does, what's new there, and go and take a look what's behind that box and zoom in a little bit and look at the flows and all the, the pipeline and what's, what's going on there. So what is, what is new in 2013? I think you see now that we combine the best of the best from both the SharePoint search and from fast search into one unified search engine in 2013. So in a content processing, what that means too is also done a lot of new innovations on top of what all was there in SharePoint and in Fast. We brought forward components that have been utilized in standalone Fast Search for Internet site uh, as well. And we'll take a look. Katharina will go through those uh, in detail later. Uh, what, a few of the things are new in there are deep link extraction, which I'm going to show you in a second. Well, it extracts content and paragraphs from Word and PowerPoint, so it's easier for users to see whether that document they're looking at it's the right one for them, and they can zoom into it closer. The smart metadata extraction is that we're looking not just for the metadata that uh, are, are implicit, but we're looking, for, for instance, for author. If we detect author um, property in, in Word document, we'll actually go in the content itself and see if that author is mentioned on the first page, for instance. Does it actually, co uh, does it actually match with what the metadata for a document says. So we'll use the, who the real author is because a lot of times there's templates in an organization that are handed out for people to start from. We don't, we don't want to use the template author for indexing into search. Uh, people search and new in content processing. We added a lot more languages there for phonetic matching and it happens within the pipeline. Katharina will show you where exactly in there it happens as it's important to if you want to build content enrichment here to know exactly which flow, what stages happen where. 
And like I said, we had document parsing for PDF and all the Office the new uh, formats in 2013 as well. The extensibility is, uh, is similar to what in FASTER for SharePoint. It's new from uh, SharePoint Server 2010. So the content enrichment web service, uh, something new we added, is similar to the FAST one. It's different in a way that the protocol are handled. So it's different how we communicate and send documents to it. So if you do come from FAST, you can still do the things you do and the capabilities, but there will be some changes uh, to how you communicate with the service. We've done a lot of improvements to make speed much more efficient uh, in this release. Uh, we have entity extractors. I'm going to demo two, so we can upload our own dictionaries and parse uh, the text and parse uh, and look for entities in all documents are fed, fed through the, the system. We have word break-ins and eye filters too. If you want to look at the linguistics and handle a different for different languages, it is possible to extend with those. And I think if you've seen all the what's new sessions and sessions throughout the week is that search powered a lot of different scenarios. So we've really gone out of our way to make it work both for business productivity through intranet as well as running, for instance, e-commerce on search, so growing your business online. So not just using search for finding documents, but also for marketing, help businesses grow and sell more products, for instance, in the e-commerce uh, environment. And it's easier to manage than ever before. I alluded to that in the architecture where everything is accessible to PowerPoint. You can scale up and down as the system is running which means you can do things like actually migrating a live system other to, to new hardware. Uh, I think they'll go through that in the scaling and sizing presentation as well. So with that, I'm going to start look, uh, look at a few uh, demos. Let's see, switch three. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah. Just double checking is there. <clears throat> Just going to take a look at the uh, Smart previews. I'm here. I have a search system. I'm going to search for search. And uh, so, what I was talking about earlier, the, the deep links. So, we could take a look at a PowerPoint here. You can now see that you can take a look inside uh, the document itself. And we extract the text in the content processing component. We extract the text and the paragraphs within it. So, if I click on it, it will take me directly to that page within the document. And I also can, of course, just browse through the document and see whether this document is something that matches what I'm looking for. Uh, I can easily take, and also for, um, for other documents, I can also do this for, uh, for Word documents and PowerPoints uh, right now. So that's just a quick overview of the, um, of the smart uh, the preview and what's happening in the content processing. Where that exactly happens, we'll look at uh, a little bit later. I'm going to move on to the uh, content uh, enrichment part. So what we've done is uh, indexed a thousand or so recipes for a um, fictional company called Contoso Food. So this is a company that has uh, users and users creating recipes and uploading them uh, to a, which we access through a web service. Uh, so it's user created content, unstructured text uh, basically. We index that through BCS and pull the data in from the web service into SharePoint search. But the text from the users are, uh, like we see, if we do a search for, instance, for food, or let's do grill. What we're getting from out of the box, I'm showing you just what happens if I create an empty search center and index content through BCS. I get, uh, I get all the, uh, the titles, et cetera and some not so friendly looking URLs. And you can see on the refiners here, it's empty, it just knows about the date. So there's nothing in, there's really nothing in the metadata that says anything about the recipes we're searching. So what we've done here, I'm just gonna show you the before so I can go to the after and look how much better it looks. So let's take a look at the, the final uh, one. So I go in here, I search for food, and I've done some easy customization here of display templates. So you've seen other sessions now that you can use just HTML5 templates to create the visualization of uh, these documents. So now I've uh, just printed the pretty URL, uh, the description, and text uh, from the data. Uh, I'm not a UX expert, so I'm putting a lot of information into the hover card here as well, which is also a custom-made one. 
But you can see from some of this data that it's just directions or description about the content. Uh, from that, from the users, we don't know a whole lot about data. If I search for food previously, I just get a lot of documents. It doesn't tell me what's in the what's in this data set here. So what we've done now is I created an entity, entity extraction dictionary and pulling out terms like Thanksgiving and Christmas to show that we do have recipes that fit for different holidays. So now our end user browsing this content can see that, okay, I do know that now there's something for Christmas or something for Thanksgiving here that I can use. Something the users themselves, the author of the content, didn't explicitly put in. Because like most users and myself, we're lazy. We don't fill out all that metadata typically as well. So now we enrich the content by pulling out extra metadata, which makes it easier for the end user now to realize what we have here in the content. And also we created a calorie counter. So this is some custom code. So all the documents are flowed through the system. Uh, we parse through the text and pull out the calories and also how many people this recipe serves. So I'm basically getting a calorie counter here. So you can see that now I can see uh, what type of healthy choices I can make for my recipes as well. Again, this is not something that the authors themselves added, that this is a healthy recipe, but this is something we concluded by doing some deeper analysis on the content itself. So you can see now here that you can see um, the curve is slightly shifted to the, to the left. I search for, search for grill, and it slightly changes to the right. So you can see here too now. It changed. So now you can see it's dynamic. The refiners are dynamic. It depends on what you search for. So now I'm getting, uh, because of I choose a different keyword, you can see that the uh, dynamic refiners here shows a different set of less healthy choices, I guess. So I want to see what's actually in these different choices. I use the visual refiners and just say I want the real unhealthy choices, and you can see we're getting burgers, et cetera. So again, it's not something the users themselves put in, but now by extracting this data, we enriched the content, added a lot more metadata, and thus we can see and make it easier for end user to go through all of this content, make it easier for them to find, uh, find what, what's there. So how did I create this, uh, this thing? I'm not gonna go through <coughs> the, the uh, display templates. There's actually a session tomorrow morning which will take this, this app and go through step by step and how to, to build this example. It's Matt King and Andrew Worley uh, around nine o'clock tomorrow. So they will go through actually how to crawl the content, how to create the display templates, and also a little bit of the uh, web service uh, extension. So I'm gonna go to the server uh, running this. Uh, I have, <coughs> here's the, uh, the backend server. I created just a simple holidays uh, CSV file. So this is the entity extraction dictionary. Fairly simple just to, I highlight the, uh, the effect of it. So I just said for any term of Easter or Thanksgiving, thanks, Thanksgiving, add a refi refiner term for thanks, uh, Thanksgiving. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna get a little bit of water. So these are terms that are now added to the, um, the document itself, and I showed it as a refiner. These, this dictionary, you can use a few simple lines of uh, PowerShell to add that dictionary in. So in the, um, this line just basically shows you, I'm pointing to a file name and I upload it and it's, uh, and it's added to the system. So then how do I reference that um, this uh, dictionary should, what fields, what managed property should it operate on? So if I go into the uh, search schema, this is on the central admin site, I've gone into the search schema and drilling down into my custom managed properties that I created. So you can see that in the uh, recipe short description field that is indexed, uh, hold on. I'm just pointing to the crawl properties for that content, and I click on the word extraction for custom one. So that means that the custom one is what I referenced in the PowerShell. So now this dictionary will work on this managed property, and you can work on other managed property as well. It's so really simple to just enrich the content by a simple dictionary. And this is something a lot of businesses can use depending on what type of business they are in, maybe not recipes, but for other type of content. 
Now for the uh, content enrichment web service, I'm calling out to another server that's running uh, a piece of code, a custom code. So just to illustrate the effect here, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to run on the SharePoint server itself. I'm pointing to a, uh, another, another machine uh, that's hosting a WCF service. And what I'm sending over is recipe nutrients. So that's just the field that has the nutritional information about uh, the recipe. What I return back is a calorie counter that I then use to set up as a refiner in the UI. A couple of other cool things here that Katharina will talk about too is that we now have a trigger value. So if you have a lot of content, millions and millions of documents, you might not want to send every piece of content over to the external web service so you can tr create a trigger condition here that says whether you should send this document over to the custom uh, service to do the processing. Now, the, all of this happens over HTTP, so it's really quick. But if you transfer a lot of data, it might slow you down a little bit. But if you don't have a whole lot of property sent over, it's really very little uh, overhead in, in the web service. And it's not like faster for SharePoint running in a contained sandbox. It's a separate uh, server that can be anywhere. So all I have to do is have to pause the full crawl, uh, pass, pause the crawl, and then run this command, and we'll up, uh, tell that to uh, for this trigger value, send all documents over to my web service. Um, so I'm going to go show you the uh, the web service and a little bit of the code on that one too. All of this that I'm talking about here is fully documented in uh, on on TechNet. So not the Contoso food example, but how to run through these, um, these steps to set up a, a service. All of that is on TechNet. So I'm skipping through this pretty quickly here, but I'm using official documentation uh, for, for this as well. Oops. So I'm going to go over to my remote server. Here's my web service. You can see now I'm just running on Windows 2008. So here I have a Visual Studio project. It's about hundred and so lines long. It's not that hard to set up. It's very simple to, to set it up. All I have to do is to take a couple of DLLs with me and reference them here in my code. So then all I have to do here now, the most important thing is to implement the process item. So for all the document that comes from anywhere from BCS or from any external content or SharePoint content can run through my service. So the item is just a document I'm getting through and the properties that uh, I, I can act on. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking the nutritional information, I just send it to a, a parse calories uh, function I have, which basically just pull out the, where the calories are mentioned and the number of serves and figure out the, um, how many calories per servings there are. I'm also just printing out some information. And then I return it back to the system. So what I'm returning here will be added back to the index. Uh, this cons uh, this uh, application here is just a console application. So I also just printed out, there's a bunch of information here, but you can see that all the, the raw text that comes through is printed out here. So if you do want to create some and inspect what type of contents coming through, you can, and you have access to, uh, to everything that's, that's within here. Uh, so that's one uh, application that uh, shows you that it's fairly simple to set up. Um, it's very simple to, I think it's very simple to set up all documentation and get this web service up and running very quickly. I'm going to show you another app, and I'm going to show it on a surface. So this is, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, that is one. So what I've done here, though, is for the Contoso food, you can think of as an internet-facing scenario. So I've done some um, content enrichment on a productivity or your sort of inside a firewall scenario. So what I've done is uh, just I created a, a search feed. But before I go in, this is a community. If you haven't seen that before, you can join communities in SharePoint now. When you go into the community front page, you'll see what's new within this community. And uh, the problem then is, well, how, what's new across all communities I'm following? So I just created a simple little search-based app, search application to showcase uh, some of the things you can do with content enrichment as well. So 
again, this is my UX, so it's not a pretty UX, but I, it does work nicely on a surface, which I was trying to get here. You can just flow through the, the different results uh, here. The results here now are, it's a personalized search feed for all the, uh, the communities I'm following and what's new from all of these communities. So instead of using the search page, I just created a different UI that's going to work much better on a, uh, on a Surface or a Apple, whatever, a touch device. So on top of here, I've extracted all the communities that these posts are from. This is just refiners on the top. And the tags are just refiners well that I, I mapped in my schema. And also, I've used entity extraction now to say what products are mentioned in all of these posts that are posted by members in all these communities. So if I want to know more about posts that are about Windows Phone, Visual Studio, I can quickly just click on this and, and go in and uh, pivot on that data. The other thing I've done is use a web service, for instance, to pull out a sort of a field. <coughs> so depending on who posted to your community, I can look up for that person, whether they are an MVP or MCM. So are they actually someone of a lot of knowledge? So I can use that information now to now just pivot into post only by highly skilled people, for instance. So I can see posts that, that I want to see and click on that and sort on it. I'm not really clicking on it right now because I can't get wireless to work on my Surface. Uh, but, uh, so that's the example app. I'm not going to go too much in detail how I created that, but it's a similar type of, um, of content enrichment I showed in the other one. So all the content that flows through, whether it's from SharePoint, Post, Newsfeed, you can act upon in the content enrichment web service and any type of line of business content that you feed through. You can do uh, enrichments on it. And it's great for a knowledge management system where people, for instance, don't fill out a lot of metadata about the documents. You can now try to add metadata about those documents uh, while uh, they all flow through the, the system. So this is the place to do it. Go back to the presentation. So we looked at a few scenarios of the value of why content enrichment is important and what you can do. And now we're going to deep, uh, much deeper into the content processing component and what's going on. Because that is important um, for how you're building a web service to understand a little bit of the architecture behind the content processing component. Yep, thank you, Runa. I'll just skip through these. OK, so we're going to go a bit behind the scenes. So we've seen how Runar has uh, taken some of the extensibility that we've built into content processing and enabled some new, really cool search-driven scenarios. Um, so these are, of course, <coughs> demos that work on a single, uh, single server. But in about uh, 15 minutes, Nils Petter is going to show you some best practices for how you can take a simple demo like that and scale it out to even a large uh, enterprise system. That's what you really need when you, uh, when you want to go into production and uh, make a performance system. So, let's see. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, about how indexing works to sort of give you the, the right background. Uh, let's look at the different components that are involved in indexing. We have the crawler. And I think uh, <clears throat> most of you will recognize the, the crawler from SharePoint 2010. It's the same crawler, but with some great new uh, uh, improvements, especially regarding freshness, so how long it takes before a document is changed until it ends up in the search index. And there was a session on that earlier today with, uh, with uh, Vaidi, and I strongly recommend that you go back and, uh, and watch that if you didn't go to that session. And then we have the content processing component, which is new uh, for SharePoint. So we've taken uh, a lot of the processing that happened inside the crawler in 2010 uh, and moved it into the content processing component together with a lot of the uh, extensible stuff that we did with uh, fast search for SharePoint. Uh, one of the benefits with having all of this in a separate component is that we can now scale out content processing independent of crawling and of uh, indexing. And then we have the index, which, uh, which also which mainly comes from, uh, from the fast search for SharePoint product. Uh, so what happens during crawling? I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the crawler will pick up changes. So if you create a new document, or you modify it, delete it, or you share it with somebody else, the crawler will pick up all these changes and then queue them up. 
uh, and then it will talk to the, uh, will push these changes to the content processing component. Inside the content processing component, there's a, a, a service called the CSS for the content submission service. And then it will uh, distribute these items across a number of flows. So the, these little green lines, the flows are really where the interesting processing happens. And that's where we've sort of combined all the intelligent logic. Uh, and we take the item and then uh, basically we populate the uh, search schema, the managed properties that go into the index. Now once that's done, the, uh, the item gets pushed to the index and it gets persisted. And then the index will say, okay, I've written the document to disk, you can now search it. So it sends an acknowledgement or a callback to the content processing component. Uh, and, then also, and then we send it back to the crawler. And at that point, you can go into the search administration page, look at the crawl log, and you can see that the URL has been successfully indexed. So we're sort of fully integrated with the, with the whole uh, search administration in SharePoint, making it much easier uh, to manage than fast search for SharePoint. Um, and then if something goes wrong during content processing or during indexing, that can happen. You could, for example, have a document that uh, is in a format that's not supported. In that case, uh, the crawler will send a fail call back to the crawl log, and then you can go and see why the item failed, and then take the appropriate action. Now let's see what happens when you start scaling out things. This is when we have to start caring about things like uh, load balancing and uh, scaling and high availability. So we, we do load balancing between the different components. So the crawler talks to uh, the uh, CSS, but the CSS will distribute the items across all the different uh, content and processing components that are available. And then obviously we also distribute the items between different indexes, so, we, uh, so that's one way we scale up. But there's also some dynamic scaling going on inside uh, the content processing component. The number of, uh, so each of these flows here, they can process one item. And there are several of these flows that run in parallel, so on a normal sort of four core VM, you can process 12 items in parallel at any given time. But if you have better hardware, we'll dynamically scale up. So we can, for a 12-core system, we'll go up to 36 documents in parallel. Um, so this will happen without you having to, uh, to worry about it. But you can override it using commandlets if you want to. For example, if you have another heavy workload on the same, on the same machine. Um, for high availability, we, uh, as I said, the, the crawler talks to an endpoint. If that endpoint in content processing becomes unavailable, it will automatically just fail over to the endpoint in a different content processing component. Uh, and finally, we have another kind of fault tolerance. Uh, if the crawler tries to uh, uh, push a document and it doesn't get contact with, uh, with the service or some other error happens, the crawler will retry the item a couple of times before giving up, because it, it's possible that the, there was just a, a network blip, blip or some transient uh, uh, situation. So now let's move on and uh, take a look at what happens inside content processing, inside one of these flows. Um, there are, crawler processes different kinds of changes, as I mentioned. It can be deletions or security updates. So there are different branches inside the flow uh, so when, for example, an item is deleted, it doesn't go through a lot of processing. It just, we just send a signal to the index that the item is deleted. And the same if there's a security update, so we just uh, update the, uh, convert the ACLs into the internal format and then write to the index. And that change goes into a separate update group in the index. That makes it a lot faster because we don't actually have to go and touch the rest of the uh, properties for that item. Um, of course, the most interesting uh, stuff happens in the main branch of the flow. That's when you, if you insert, uh, if you upload a new document or if you modify an existing document, uh, the crawler will send a bunch of properties, crawled properties, to content processing. The actual item, it won't send across the wire because they can be very big. It will write it to a temporary place and then the content processing will just pick that up and then send it to the parser. <clears throat> we have a new parsing framework in 2013. So we've added some new uh, uh, format handlers for the new uh, Office 2013 formats, as well as uh, PDF. 
So you now have native support for PDF inside SharePoint, which is something I think a lot of people have been uh, <laughs> wanting. Uh, the uh, document parsing will also add more properties, more crawl properties to the item. Uh, this can be metadata, like the title and author of the document. So once we have all the possible metadata for the document, uh, that's when we look at the search schema that comes out of the box or that you've uh, defined, and then map everything to manage properties. And from sort of from this point on, where the flow only is only processing managed properties, uh, we then do some magic to extract or to convert security descriptors and then to do language detection. And I'll skip over the web service callout in this slide because out of the box, the web service callout is not enabled. Uh, so the next thing that happens is that we go into uh, a step that deals with, um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that prepares uh, the properties that are used for people search. So it will, there will be a processing of names uh, to create phonetic name variations that will let you do uh, fuzzy searching on names. Uh, then that, all the, the whole stream of text that's been created gets broken into different tokens. Uh, and then we do the metadata extraction. And that is really what's, um, uh, what's driving the, uh, smart, uh, the deep links and the smart previews that you see. And uh, finally, we extract a summary of the document. And then we take a look at all the links that were found in the document, write them to the analytics database, and then at some later point in time, uh, a different timer job will go and analyze those links and calculate the rank of the document and then send that to the index. So it's quite a lot of uh, stuff happening in there. And I have to say content processing is it's not really a, an exact science. We're dealing with a lot of uh, unstructured data, a lot of different formats, a lot of different languages. <clears throat> so we don't always know what's best for your content. Uh, so that's why we've built in some customization uh, capabilities into the content processing flow. Uh, so we have, like in uh, our previous release, we have uh, support for eye filters. So you can just uh, use uh, PowerShell commandlet to register your eye filters uh, and uh, then do a full crawl. Like, there's one slight difference with document parsing in this version is that we look at the, we select the eye filter or the sort of the handler for the document based on an analysis of the document itself, of the, the binary form. So we don't just look at the extension, because that can often be wrong. So uh, finding the handler is more exact in 2013. Um, the other place that you can um, extend is the word breaking. So you can, you can uh, add a whole new custom word breaker, or you can add new terms to, the, to a word breaker dictionary so that you can you look at terms like AT&T, for example, which would norm normally be split into three different tokens. You can add that as an exception, and then that will be just a single token uh, when you search. Uh, Runar <coughs> has already uh, mentioned uh, made use of the custom entity extraction. So you saw how we could just create a list, uh, or uh, just a text file containing uh, holidays, and then add that using a PowerShell commandlet. Um, I want to call out there sort of there are 12 uh, dictionaries that you can add in 2013, and there are some dictionaries work on uh, case are case sensitive, some are case insensitive, and some work on the raw text, and some work on the tokenized text, so that you can create uh, entity extractors for CJK languages, for example. Uh, and then finally, there's the uh, the web service callout, and I'll go into more detail on that in the in the next slide. Actually, I just wanted to mention one more thing here. As you see, the web service callout is uh, is located in a sort of a very in a particular place in the flow, and that has some bearing on what you can and what you can't do with the web service. So, for example, you can see that language detection comes before the web service callout. So that means that the language property is something that you can use in your web service. So you can say, okay, if if it's English, do this, or if it's French, do something else with the content. Uh, and then everything that comes after the web service callout is something that you could potentially uh, influence with the managed properties that you output from the web service. So one example is for people search. 
you could, for example, create a new property uh, that contains all the names that were found in the document, put them in a put them in a in a property, and then make that managed property uh, phonetically aware, or you mark it in the search schema as a sort of a people search property, and then the people search stage will go and then do fuzzy name analysis on your property as well. So just one example of what you can do. So <clears throat> looking a little bit more at sort of the, the workflow, like how you go about configuring this, uh, this is the uh, Contoso web service that Runar uh, showed you. Uh, and let's see. If, yeah. Uh, so what you, what you want to do in this scenario is first to go and configure your search schema because the managed properties that the Contoso web service will output uh, will need to be part of the search schema. So you can, the web service can uh, output properties that are not present on an item, but they have to be defined in the search schema. Uh, and for the input, anything that the web service needs to consume has to be a managed property. So this is a, uh, maybe one of the biggest, one of the main changes from the way that it worked, uh, the pipeline extensibility worked uh, in fast search for SharePoint. So you need to take your curl properties and map them to managed properties before they can be consumed by the web service. Uh, and then uh, you will uh, configure the web service client using PowerShell. And you need to be a search admin in order to enable this. Obviously, when we're sending managed properties back and forth, possibly to a remote uh, server, there can be uh, sensitive information there. So we don't want to, we don't want anybody to be able to just go ahead and do that. Uh, now let's take a look at some of the uh, the configuration options. So we, when you use, uh, as you saw in the Runar's example, you configure the endpoint for the web service and the inputs and the output managed properties. Uh, and in this case, we've also configured a trigger to say, okay, only send documents to the web service if the content source is Contoso food. Uh, this trigger expression is uh, written in a sort of a separate, almost like a separate programming language uh, called the expression language. And that's been, it's documented on TechNet, so you can go back and reference it. But it basically has uh, logical operators like and and or and, and not and it also has a number of functions so you can do <clears throat> you can do string matching like if you can for example check that a managed property starts with a particular string you can do some regular expression matching you can look at dates uh, you can add up uh, number of properties so you can do you can be quite creative with the with the triggers so let's just look at an example if an, in, if an item comes through and it doesn't uh, have content source controls of food, it will just go through to the index and nothing more will happen. If it does contain controls of food, it will go to the web service and the web service will do, will do its processing and then it will go to the index. Uh, there's a couple of more things I wanted to call out and one is the uh, failure mode. So you remember I, um, I talked about callbacks earlier, it, you know, the fail callbacks and successful callbacks. Now, if you set your uh, failure mode to be error and something happens when you do the web service call out, for example, your web service is down, in that case, the content processing component will send a fail callback to the crawler and you'll be able to see in the crawl log that the item failed and, and why it failed. But if you set it to be warning, uh, the item will still get indexed, but it won't have the managed properties that come from the web service. So this lets you decide you know, whether the web service call out, is it mission critical? Do you, re do you actually wanna not index the document if it's not working or is it okay, optional, if it's, if it's there or not? Um, and finally, the debug mode is something that you'll use when you're doing development. <clears throat> basically, if you turn it on, it will, the, uh, the flow will, will just send all the managed properties on the item to the web service. So it won't send the ones that you configured, it will just send you everything so that you can take a look at which managed properties are there, what do they look like, so you can build the logic in your web service. And then once you're sort of ready to go into production, you'll, uh, you'll switch the debug mode off. Uh, one important thing to note is that there's just a single <coughs> uh, endpoint that you can configure here. 
So all the calls will go to the single web service endpoint. So this can have, uh, obviously, performance implications if you scale out. And Nils Petter is going to talk about how you can address some of that. But I just wanted to show you uh, a new health report that we added um, to the search administration. This health report lets you, you can access it together with the other crawl health reports. And it tells you uh, what happens inside content processing. So you can go and select which activities that you want to look at. And it will tell you, sort of on average, how much time does the word breaker spend uh, per document? How much time is spent in document parsing, for example? That can be really useful to see why your call performance is dropping. If document parsing is spending a lot of time, then you're probably processing very heavy documents. If indexing time is really high, then you know, the indexing is a bottleneck, and maybe you need to scale out the number of indexers that you have if you're not happy with the crawl rate. And in here, you can also see how much time content enrichment is spending. So how much time is your web service uh, adding to the overall uh, uh, processing cost? And the same with the custom entity extractors. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Nils Petter now so he can show you how you can get around some of the limitations.
code and you can do everything with your SDB. There's no need for any code. We're just going to configure the login service. And I'll start by showing you uh, my solution. So here I created a normal WPF service application project and the browsing service. And I'll show you first the web config. I have four sections I want to show you. If we start with the service section, this is where we expose the, the routing service. And the most important part here is the contract where we're using the I request with I router. So that this is a request with I channel. And then there's the client section where I define all the endpoints that the router is talking to. So you can see here I, I actually uh, configured four endpoints, not two. So it's not just Compute and uh, Community Search. There's also one extra endpoint as a backup for each one. And I'll show you a little bit later how, how the backup uh, works. Then in the behavior section, have a new routing element. Uh, I'm referencing the filter table that we're going to define here soon. And I'm letting it know that I need to route on more than just the header because we need such an incremental copy of the sole And then finally, there's the routing section. Initially, we define the filters. I define two filters here. I won't go into detail, but <coughs> All they do is inspect the soap envelope they receive, look at the property uh, of the content source, and try to figure out which one it is. After we define the filters, we have the mapping section uh, where we map each filter to an endpoint. And in addition, I configure a backup list, which I define uh, further down here. What happens here is if the routing service gets a communication exception or a timeout exception, and there's a couple of other exceptions as well, from the primary endpoint, it will start going through the backup list and just pick the uh, sequentially until it finds one, finds one that works. So we added a little bit of uh, fault tolerance here. And that's basically everything you have to do besides the, the service file where you need to normally reference your own assembly and your own class uh, with your web service implementation. So since we don't have any web service implementation here, we're going to reference the, the routing class. So everything was configured with the character. So I can just show you the implementation that I, I didn't complete at all. Uh, now for the, for the next thing I'm going to show you, you were supposed to see a lot of live stuff, but unfortunately uh, my network didn't really work so you fix this instead. <coughs> so here's the configuration uh, where I listed the, the router that you just saw as the endpoint. And I created a trigger that would only send out documents for people to do or community search. And the reason I did that was uh, just for the sake of this example. I also have a console source that Uh, you can see the content crossing filter report here. Uh, I thought I would just exit it. Just show you a version which wasn't uh, as complex as the ones that we have. So you can see very clearly here, it's uh, quite a short time span, uh, how much time do we stack bars that Uh, I was going to show you this running live now so that you could actually see how the router was, the router was working. Uh, but instead, you're getting a video from my hotel room at 4 a.m. this morning. <laughs> it's not going to be as exciting as it sounds. But you'll see uh, the performance counters for the three web services. We have the routing service, which is the red bar. And then we have the composer service, which is the green, and the blue is the 
And of course, the, the sum of the two bars on the right side will always be uh, the same as the value for the log. So you can see here how the currently we don't have that many computational documents being pointed. But this represents false, false processing for each service. And this data is zero. Thank you, Nils Petter. <clears throat> yes, just to round off and summarize, so you've seen how we can use the content enrichment web service to build uh, new search experiences. Uh, we've taken a look behind the scenes at the content processing architecture in 2013 and then seen how we can actually, you know, take uh, these fun demos and turn them into, uh, into deployments that actually scale. So if you want to learn more uh, about content processing and about content enrichments, we have a, a blog that was published just today, the first link there. You'll find the, the link in the PowerPoint. Uh, and then that will give you sort of a, a walkthrough of a basic scenario. And then there's also documentation on TechNet uh, that's linked from that blog. And then as Nils Petter said, there's some new blogs coming out that will show you exactly how we did the WCF routing that was shown in this, uh, in this session. Uh, and then there's also one coming on how to do uh, sort of best practices for debugging. So we've sort of taken the questions that we've got from our, our TAP customers and seen what, you know, what are people asking about when it comes to content enrichment and turn that into blog posts. So if you, uh, you know, after you leave the session, if you have more questions or if you want to, uh, you can come up, we can do some, um, uh, some questions right now, or you can come up afterwards, or you can, you know, post a comment uh, on the blog. So we're very happy to to interact with you because we're really building these features for, you know, for our partners and for our customers. So we want you to be uh, be able to build all the different cool scenarios that you uh, that you want. And we'll also be at the Ask the Expert session tomorrow. Uh, I just wanted to mention too that we have the sort of the architect behind the content processing component here today, Kjetil Lebergstrand. So there's four of us here who can answer questions if there are any. Thank you. So a question on the uh, callbacks? Yeah. Um, so first of all, can those be set from the web service and can they be read from a BCS uh, custom connector? Uh, so the callbacks, so the you know, when the web service uh, completes its processing uh, and then the item gets indexed, then it's the, the sort of the index will send the callback, but the callback sort of includes uh, the, you know, the status for all the processing. So if the web service was successful, then the callback and everything else was successful, then the callback will be successful. If it failed, uh, then the callback will be failed. So it's sort of yeah. part of the it's whole. It's a binary. There's no yeah, way it's a binary. To, okay. And from the, is that available then to the, to the to a custom connector as well? Yeah, so the, the, it's also available. I don't think the, the custom connector doesn't get the callback. I think, I think it's the crawler that will, would get the callback. But you would also, you know, if a, if a document that was crawled by a custom connector failed, you would also see the error in the crawl log. So that's all integrated okay. uh, so in one place. My dream scenario was being able to have some specific parameters set in the callback and then having uh, additional action taken on the, on the part of the customer connector. Mm. That's not something we That's do. not something that we, uh, that we have, unfortunately. Okay, thanks. Um, if you have um, custom XMLs in, in the Office documents, and I would like to have uh, one specific element in the custom XML indexed as a, um, a managed property, is that possible, and how I, would I do that? I think it's possible um, through BCS. I think so. I know in Fast Search for SharePoint we had this sort of XML mapper. I don't know if that's maybe that's the kind of capability you're referring to, but um, there you could sort of define a mapping between XML elements and managed properties. But there's a way that you can achieve the same with BCS, and I think there's already uh, uh, a blog out 
on that particular topic. So if you go, I'm not sure if it's in the IT Pro or the or sort of the dev blocks, but I think we've already sort of walked through a scenario how you can do that. So maybe take a look at that. How does BCS relate to, to custom XML within the Office documents? I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it to know that for sure. So you're talking about the sort of the, uh, the open XML? Yes. Yeah. That I'm not sure about. Um, but you should have a handle to the binary or the original file, right? So you could get a handle of all the XML and parse that. Uh, but no, where it, would I put the code to, uh, code to do that? So, so where is the extensibility point for me to put the code so I can? I mean, it's easy to write the, the it's easy to write the code to grab the XML and, and find the element. But where can I put it so it to make sure it's indexed? We, we can yeah. Okay, but but um, I got the impression that. Um, the, the crawled properties were uh, established before, so if I want to, can I create new managed properties as part of the? So if you, as long as you define them as a schema prior to crawling, create new properties, then you can, you can request that binary as part of the crawling process. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So yeah, yeah, so they have to exist in the schema beforehand, basically. I think you guys answered this question already, but is there still a one-to-one -one ratio for CPU cores to doc procs? I mean, doc procs have uh, well, replaced. not exactly one-to-one, -one, but there is a fixed relationship. So there's, I think it's like uh, one CPU core is like four, is it four or three flows in parallel? Uh, what one CPU core is how many flows? Is it? Yeah, it's three. Equals the number of flows. So yeah. flows is basically the equivalent of doc processors. Right? Yeah, you know, kind of because each each doc processor would do one document in par in yeah one document and each flow processes one document. Okay, so that's that's what that. Yeah, so you can override that. So if you have a very powerful machine or you're processing very light content, you could sort of scale out the number right. of of, uh, of flows. And can you do multiplexing in the pipeline extension stages? Before it was you you called one executable and you had to add actual additional logic there in order to. Uh, are you talking about sort of piping output from one into the Just into additional another? pipeline extension stages. Mm, well, so what? Uh, no, you can't do you can't do multiple sort of uh, after one another. You would have to sort of embed that into the into one so web you service. Still have to write some logic to do that. Yeah, I'd have to write some logic to do that. I mean, it's it's obviously a, a feature that would be very nice to have. Then we're you know we're we're considering, but uh, it's not okay. there in this version. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, so can we drop a document um, from the pipeline? Uh, the functionality was there in fast ESP, was removed in fast search for um, SharePoint 2010. Uh, but is it possible to drop a document when it is? Sorry, called? can you, if it's possible to? <clears throat> drop a document. Oh, to drop, you know, to not yeah, index not, the document. Not, yeah, not yeah I think, you, I mean, you could achieve it if you're, uh, uh, if you configure the failure mode to error for the web service and it would always return a failure, then the document would get dropped. Oh, yeah, not to put Matt King on the spot here, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he did that in his, <laughs> <laughs> he did it in his presentation tomorrow, so that example did exactly what mm. he said. So. Thank you. Hi. Uh, do you have to implement the content enrichment web service in C Sharp? No. It's a web service. Yeah, it's just a SOAP web service. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Whatever. Okay. Um, when you can have different crawlers and different CSS for scaling uh, purposes, wouldn't it be possible to hardwire these? So that you have different configurations per crawler CSS, like the, the old fast mm. pipelines models. There's only there's only one configuration, like the content processing flow. So that that's kind of fixed. So you can't override that. Thanks. So so it looks like I still have in my mind two options to do the enrichment. I can either do it in BCS connector or doing it in a web service. Like the, the enrichment service. So, do you guys have any scenario or guideline or recommendation how to choose between the two? 
Well, I don't think you could actually do. I mean, you, I don't think you could do it in BCS, but you could do it before it got crawled. Uh, so, for, I mean, before it was picked up by by BCS. So for for a like a custom or like a third party repository, I can either write a BCS connector. Yeah. And then put in some metadata, or I can use one of the built-in connectors and then try to enrich with injecting metadata. So those kind of a scenario that's kind of common in our environment. So that's why I wonder if there's you guys have any. I think um, I think one it, yeah it depends on a bit on your scenario. But if your scenario is to apply the same kind of processing to all of your content you know, both SharePoint and external, then having it inside the content processing would be like be the only place where you could actually see all the content, where, where all the content's coming through. So that could be one, you know, one consideration when you're deciding where to implement it. So just 